Introduction to Orthopedic Trauma for OR Staff. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Christoph Pape, and uh, this is Sakib Rahman narrating. Uh, this is the second out of our three videos from this slide deck. Uh, we went through, um, in the first video, a uh, basic um, operating room uh, flow. We talked about terminology. Uh, especially with regard to you know, fracture displacement, fracture patterns, um, different types of fractures that we see. And um, now we're going to talk uh, a lot about the, the implants and techniques that we're utilizing in the operating room. So there's a spectrum of fracture fixation stability, everything from uh, a splint or a cast, as shown on the left, uh, to... Um, using pins and external fixation, all the way to doing uh, intramedullary nails and, and very rigid internal fixation like compression plates and screws. And as we are able to provide increased stability, uh, oftentimes it comes at the cost of more biologic damage and more invasive approaches uh, enable, in order to uh, provide that stability. <clears throat> so a little bit about screw design. Um, so here is an example of a screw. Uh, and a screw, of course, has a screw head. Usually, of course, there are headless screws as well, but the average screw has a screw head. There's a screw shaft. Uh, there are threads or a threaded portion. It could be the full length of the screw. Um, some screws are partially threaded. Um there is a certain pitch or that angle of the screw threads to the shaft. These are just some of the terminology um, that uh, you'll hear. Of course, the head is where you place your screwdriver for a purchase. It could be in different shapes, a hex. It could be somewhat of a star drive. Um, the um, uh, shaft is important because... Uh, you will know that there are different drill diameters that are used. So, for example, the drill you will need to use to place this screw in will have to be something that accommodates this diameter, right? So whatever this is between here and here, obviously you don't want to drill all the way out to where the screw threads are, otherwise the screw won't do anything. Uh, but you will need to drill at least this core portion of the so if this is, for instance, let's say a 3.5 millimeter cortical screw, well, then that shaft, this part here, is typically 2.5. So that's how you would drill to allow the shaft to, in, and then the threads, to, the shaft to enter the hole and the threads to then engage the bone. And the tip of the screw can be blunt. Uh, it can be have a self-tapping um, uh, appearance to it. And you'll look at it if you pull the screw out of the tray, you'll see it looks different. And sometimes some screws have a drilling tip on the end of it. Here are some of those different screw head designs. If you look at them end on, uh, this is over here, the sort of, I was talking about like a star, star shape or star drive. Um, there's a hex, there could be a Phillips uh, for some of the smaller screws nowadays. Here's another way of looking at uh, that screw design or screw anatomy, uh, where you have the the different diameters here that I showed earlier. That root diameter is, for instance, in our previous example, that 2.5 millimeter root or the shaft. And then the thread diameter is um, if you were doing like, let's say a lag screw. And you know, a lot of times we'll say, you know, I'll take a um, the uh, 3.5 millimeter drill first and you drill the the gliding hole, well, that 3.5 millimeters is accommodating the full threads. Of the screw will just slip right into the hole. And then a lot of times you drill that pilot hole with a 2.5 millimeter to allow the threads to then engage that part. Um, so uh, this is another way to sort of like look at your screw anatomy. Um, the thread profile is typically a buttress shape. It has a flat, broad surface. It's shaped like this because you don't want the screw to pull out in that direction, right? So it's sort of, you, you want it to insert easily this way, but not, not pull out this way. So you can see how the screw design helps to resist that pull out and increases the holding power. <clears throat> 
Screws will look different if they're cortical versus cancella. So a cortical screw, you can kind of just look at those pictures for comparison. Uh, you have a uh, smaller pitch, decreased thread to core diameter ratio. There's more threads to purchase in that cortex and you get like a better bite, even though there's a smaller width of the screw. Cancella screw, you can see has that larger pitch, right? So the screw, the thread, you know, the distance between those threads is more. Uh, oftentimes you don't have to tap. If you look, this is a non-self-tapping screw, actually, if you look at that blunted tip. Uh, and uh, this relies on that surface area of the thread, uh, which is much bigger, right? You can see the difference here, you know, between here and out here, right? This difference, this difference here is much more than that difference between here and here, right? So you can see you're getting all this sort of purchase in that cancellous bone, which is softer bone, so we need it. Um, and uh, there's a bigger, um, there are bigger threads, increased thread to core ratio, as I just kind of showed you there. What about cannulated screws? Well, cannulated screws, you know, you put a pin in first, uh, and then perhaps this can allow you to more carefully and accurately place uh, the eventual screw by using, you know, a, a pin with a little bit less uh, invasive um, uh, technique. You're not making as big of a hole. Uh, but um, when you do this, then you have to measure over the wire and then you drill over the wire with a cannulated uh, instrument and then the screw goes over the wire as well. Um, you do have to be careful um, when these are inserted uh, that uh, if the wire, for instance, is uh, you know inserted like this, and when you go to put your drill in, that the drill is sort of, I mean, I exaggerate here, but if the drill, let's say if this is the pin, and if the drill is not exactly collinear and it's coming at a little bit of an angle, let's say, like this, you could potentially shear off the pin right there. So the smaller cannulated screws, this is a somewhat of a risk, and uh, these are much more costly. So keep in mind, cannulated screws, because of the design that goes into having to produce them, uh, it's a little more sophisticated. These are far more costly, uh, and one could argue overused. Uh, screws come in different sizes. So just at a really basic, basic level in the in the in the you know, original AO trays, for example, there's large fragment, there's small fragment, there's mini fragment, all types of variation of this. Classic AO large fragment include, you know, 3.2 millimeter, uh, 4.5 millimeter uh, drills that for 4.5 millimeter screws, and then small fragment usually is like 3.5 millimeter screws with a 2.5 millimeter drill. Mini fragment, you can have 2.0 millimeter screws, 2.7 screws, and then corresponding you know, drills that go with that, and even smaller than that, 1.5, for example. So what about locking screws? Everything we talked about are standard screw heads. Now you can see that head has threads as well. So uh, locking screws, you'll also notice, have a much smaller pitch if you look at the screws here. Greater number of threads per distance. So they're uh, very good to hold into dense bone, uh, but then most importantly, that head, this thing locks into the plate, and there's an advantage sometimes to doing that. Uh, and sometimes there's certain techniques to get that screw to lock, and sometimes the locking screw design might look a little bit different than that, but that's a very traditional, sort of original design locking screw. Um, now, when, so, those are actual screw, um, those are actual implants. When we use the term position screw and lag screw, that is not an implant. That's sort of like a screw function. So I can take a cortical screw and say, we're going to make this a position screw or we're going to make this a lag screw. So you can never say, give me the lag screw or give me the position screw. That doesn't exist. You say, give me the 3.5 millimeter cortical screw and 32 millimeters length, and I'm going to insert that um, as a lag screw. So when we say lag screw, that is when we put a screw in to compress two fragments together, and oftentimes it means, like I mentioned earlier, drilling this 
gliding hole and then a separate pilot hole. So it often requires two different drill sizes. Whereas the position screw uh, is holding two fragments together, but we're not using that lag technique. So it's another way to hold fractures together without compressing them. Maybe you're already holding it with a forcep or clamp or it's being held uh, with pins or you don't want to over compress because there's bone loss. So what about plates? Well, plates function to hold fractures reduced. They attach to bone typically with screws, sometimes with cables. Um, and uh, the different types of plates have somewhat generic names, but a lot of them are trade names and you know named by the manufacturer. So a lot of the original AO plates, um, for example, were called you know the, the the ones the straight plates would be called limited contact dynamic compression plates or LCDCP. That's just an example of a plate you might find in a small fragment AO tray. Um, uh, so there's plate types and then there's plate function, just like we talked about the screw types and screw function. Uh, if I say I'm doing a compression plating technique, then that's what I'm doing with the plate. I could potentially do that with a recon plate uh, and make it function as a compression plate. Um, so... Uh, any generic plate can perform potentially any function. Some plates are a little bit better designed for certain functions than others. But um, so there's this concept of, again, like what the plate is doing versus what that plate is actually called. So here are some of the plate functions, a neutralization plate. So I can't say, please give me the neutralization plate from the, tr from, no, that doesn't exist. You can say, please give me the 3.5 LCDCP 10 hole plate, and I'm going to use that as a neutralizing plate. And a lot of times what that means is we've done a lag screw and now we're just protecting the lag screw, you know, against rotational forces. So a lot of times we're fixing a fibula fracture, we fix with a lag screw perhaps, uh, the main obliquity of the fracture, and then we use maybe a one-third tubular plate to act as a neutralizing so that that person later on twists their ankle, the lag screw doesn't pull out, that plate is protecting it. Sometimes we'll use the plate as the main form of compression for the fracture. So a transverse fracture like this, you can't really put a lag screw across. You don't have that you know, obliquity like you do here. Um, so instead, you use a certain type of plate design where when this screw goes in here, it's going to hit the plate, the plate's going to move this way, and it's going to sort of, you know, compress this fracture together. And that's a whole other concept, but the point being is that a plate can be used in compression technique as a function of, the, of, of how you're using that plate. Uh, and that could be done potentially with many different types of plates. Buttress plating is when we perhaps are going to fix something like this uh, medial tibia plateau fracture, uh, and it's a partial articular fracture, and we just want to um, be able to provide, um, uh, we want to neutralize against axial load. So we know that this fragment here, when this person tries to stand on it, is going to go down this way. So having this plate here helps to prevent that from axial, you know, now this thing is kind of locked in here and this fragment can't go anywhere because of that buttress function. Sometimes we'll also use the term anti-glide plate. Tension band plating. I think when you hear the word tension band, a lot of times you're often thinking about wire technique and uh, tension band wiring. But the concept of a tension band uh, sometimes will be utilized when talking about plate fixation as well. So Here's an example where, you know, a plate can function in a tension band. So what's happening is you're converting tension forces into compression. So when this person weight bears here, there's a tendency for, you know, tension to occur here. Um, but the plate resists that and allows for compression forces. Um, bridge plating also is a function. I can't say give me the bridge plate. What I can say is Give me that, you know, 4.5 millimeter narrow um, LCDC plate 12 holes, uh, and I'm going to uh, have this function as a bridge plate, uh, as shown here. And that is often done, done, you know, when we're not doing interfragmentary fixation and compression of all these fragments, but we are sort of creating a bridge over it uh, and uh, fixing above and below it.
like you would with an intramedullary nail. So when we talk about intramedullary nails, there are all types, conventional, um, femoral nail like shown here. Other terms you may hear are reconstruction nails. That's a type of nail that happens to have typically two screws that go up into the femoral head shown here, uh, or I should say shown here, these two screws. Um, and uh, cephalomedullary nails are, uh, there's many different companies that make these, but these are usually used to fix like intertrochanteric femur fractures or sometimes subtrochanteric femur fractures. Uh, and these have a typically a, large lag screw or blade or double screw device or something that goes up into the femoral head uh, and oftentimes has this sort of telescoping type device to allow compression. External fixators, there are standard bar and uh, clamp devices like shown here. Uh, and then there's also the ring fixator uh, devices uh, as shown below. So um, depending on where you practice, uh, you may see a lot of ring fixators, or maybe very few, uh, but uh, standard frames um, are a little bit simpler to use, oftentimes used for temporary stabilization, uh, but also for definitive fixation, and these are the types of um, fixators you might see. All right, so let's pause here, and we'll wrap up talking about uh, x-rays, and we'll, we'll go through some um, sort of fracture fixation cases in the last and final video of this um, lecture. Thanks.